Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. This is my first visit to Florida State, and I'm delighted that you all have come out this evening, and I'm looking forward to a profitable discussion on this topic tonight. The British author C.S. Lewis once remarked that God is not the sort of thing that you can be moderately interested in. After all, if God does not exist, there's no reason to be interested in him at all. On the other hand, if God does exist, then this is supremely interesting. And life's most important question will be, how am I to be rightly related to this being upon whom I depend moment by moment for my very existence? So people who shrug their shoulders and say, oh, what difference does it make whether God exists or not, merely show that they haven't thought very deeply about this question. Even atheist philosophers like Sartre and Camus, who have thought deeply about this question, recognize that the existence of God makes a tremendous difference for mankind. I believe that as we probe the natural world around us, we discover signposts of transcendence, as it were, pointing beyond the natural world to its ground in a transcendent personal being. And tonight I'd like to share with you seven of these reasons that I find convincing and uh, we'll open them for your consideration and discussion. Now whole books have been written on each one of these, so all I can do in the brief time allotted to me is to briefly sketch each argument. And then during the discussion time, we can go into any of them in more depth that you care to talk about. You'll find in your program a handout which gives the premises or the outlines of each argument as I'm going to discuss them. And I would encourage you to follow along with the handout. First of all, then, why anything at all exists. This is the most profound question of philosophy. Why is there something rather than nothing? In his biography of the great Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, Norman Malcolm reports that Wittgenstein said he sometimes had an experience which could best be described by saying that when I have it, I wonder at the existence of the world. I am then inclined to use such phrases as how extraordinary that anything should exist or how extraordinary that the world should exist. This mystery, which according to Aristotle lay at the very root of philosophy, is one which even thoughtful atheists cannot avoid. Derek Parfit, for example, agrees that no question is more sublime than why there is a universe, why there is anything rather than nothing. Now, experience teaches that premise one on your handout, everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or else in an external cause. This principle seems to me quite plausible, at least more so than its contradictory or its negation. Imagine that you were walking through the woods and you came across a translucent ball lying on the forest floor. You would find the claim quite bizarre that that ball just exists there inexplicably. And merely increasing the size of the ball, even until it becomes the size of the entire cosmos, would do nothing to eliminate the need for an explanation of its existence. According to this first principle then, Everything that exists is either one of two types. The first type is something that exists necessarily by a necessity of its own nature. Examples? Well, many mathematicians believe that numbers, sets, and other abstract objects exist in this way. If such entities exist, they just exist necessarily without any cause of their being. The other type is anything that has an external cause of its existence. Examples? Mountains, planets, galaxies, people. They have causes outside of themselves which explain why they exist. Now it's obvious that premise two, the universe, exists. It therefore follows logically that the universe has an explanation of its existence. 
So what sort of explanation could the universe have? Well, it seems plausible that premise three, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is an external, transcendent, personal cause. Why? Because the cause of the universe must be greater than the universe. Think of what the universe is. All of space and time and its contents. So the cause of the universe must be beyond space and time. Therefore, it cannot be physical or material. Now, there are only two kinds of things that fit that description. Either abstract objects, like numbers, or else an intelligent mind. But abstract objects can't cause anything. That's part of the definition of what it means to be abstract. The number seven, for example, doesn't cause anything. Therefore, it follows that premise four, the explanation of the universe, is an external, transcendent, personal cause. That is to say, there exists an unembodied mind which created the universe which is what most people have traditionally meant by the word God. So it seems to me that this is a sound argument for thinking that the explanation of why anything exists rather than nothing is to be found in a personal, transcendent, unembodied mind which is necessary in its existence and is the cause of the contingent universe. Number two, the origin of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Was there a beginning to the universe? Or does it just go back and back and back forever? Typically, atheists have said that the universe is just eternal, and that's all. But there are good reasons, both philosophically and scientifically, to doubt that this is the case. Philosophically, the idea of an infinite past seems absurd. If the universe never had a beginning, that means that the number of past events in the history of the universe is infinite. But mathematicians recognize that the existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to self-contradictions. For example, what is infinity minus infinity? Well, mathematically, you get self-contradictory answers. For example, if you had an infinite number of coins that were numbered one, two, three, and so on to infinity, and I took away all the odd-numbered coins, how many coins would you have left? Well, you'd still have all the even-numbered coins, or an infinite number of coins. So, infinity minus infinity is infinity. But now suppose instead that I took away all the coins numbered four or greater. So would you have left then? Well, three. So infinity minus infinity is three.